Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, as I'm not intending to do you any harm, I'm not going to speak French. Uh, so I'll stick to English. I ho hope you, you understand me. I'm, I'm not talking about religion. Or not only, but also for personal reasons, because I'm not interested in religion. Uh, and I'm not going to cite Donald Trump. I'm talking about uh, the financing of terrorism. Uh, I'm not personally from Vienna, but from the southern, southeastern region of Austria. It's called Styria, and its capital is Graz. In Graz, in the last few years, we found out that there are eight new mosques, eight new Salafist mosques, with some 600 male believers that are not altogether dangerous, but a few of them definitely are. They all come from Bosnia, from the northwestern part of Bosnia, where the by whole villages and build up their own territory. They are armed, they don't let anybody in. But this region is one of the poorest regions of southeastern Europe. So how could they afford to buy up a huge grab of land? And our intelligence, I have to say something to my pro uh, profession, I've been for 30 years in security politics and, and one of my jobs is to control our secret service so I have much to do with intelligence and our military intelligence, our military service uh, is, is quite professional and quite successful uh, in, in, in the Balkans. What we know is uh, this purchases of great areas of land in northern Bosnia is financed by Arab countries and Arab dollars. That's quite clear. Parts of that intelligence have been published. Parts of this intelligence are going to be published yet. What are the sources? Where does this money exactly come from? As far as we know, there's an old Saudi tradition in that region uh, beginning with the civil war in former Yugoslavia. But within the last years, there have been more and more uh, rich donors from two countries, from Kuwait and from Qatar. And more and more of those funds are coming from those countries. But they are not only buying land and building up their own territory, they are also doing something they call welfare. And intelligence shows quite clearly that welfare, not only from Muslim relief, but especially from organizations like Al Karama in Geneva and Switzerland, are closely co connected to jihadist groups. Uh, one of the major bank houses, HSBS, has been, has been stopped now, supporting and transferring money for Muslim relief. Others are going to be stopped. Because when you scrutinize those flows of money, you find money used for very different reasons. So what's the basic problem behind that? And in, in that respect, I'm, I'm speaking as an economist. You see, uh, in economic terms, funding terrorist cells is not very simple, but on the other hand, not very complicated. A very different thing is building up a state. Building up a state with a huge territory, with eight million inhabitants, with an army consisting of fighters, that I used to get $200 a month that has declined drastically, but it has started at $200. Uh, 
And there's one condition that can't be missed. And this condition is an attempt to build up an Islamic State on a territory with a government, with armed forces, with coercion in any way, has to have open borders. Without open borders, the establishment of a new Islamic State in whatever region you choose is not possible. So the most important thing is, does IS, does Daesh find open borders? And the answer, more or less, it changes gradually, but not basically, is yes. The most important open border is the open border to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, and in a very special respect, uh, in terms of arms, to Abu Dhabi. The most important fundraisers for uh, the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq are based in Doha, in Qatar. The five most notorious donors are donating every year, every month, millions of dollars. We know this subject, it's internationally known, that spent every month uh, two million dollars, which were transferred through Kuwait to the forces of IS in Syria and in Iraq. But why doesn't anybody intervene? Why aren't they stopped? Doha and Qatar are not out of the world. It's a state with some 275,000 inhabitants. Qatar is not strong. Nobody has to be afraid of Qatar. One of the answers is the most important military base in the region is in Doha. So the US troops, if they had the order to do it, could just leave their base and could finish the terrorist business in Doha within half an hour. But they don't do it. Because the main interest is to keep their military base in Qatar, in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, in some other states in the region. That's the first point. Second is the question of oil. Because the major part of financing uh, Islamic State in Syria and in Iraq has been done by exporting crude or, or partially refined uh, oil out of the, at the beginning 350 wells in the occupied region. But you have to sell this oil and you can't only sell it to your own population, you have to export it. And for that you need open borders too. And for this reason, and for, for, for this job, a partially open border to Turkey was most important. We have the proofs, it's well known, it has been done, and it's still being done. We don't exactly know how, to, to which level Turkish authorities have been involved in that. But we know they have been involved. And for many years, the government in Ankara has done almost nothing to stop that and to stop supporting IS and to stop allowing the fighters of uh, IS being treated in Turkish hospitals and so on and so on. I don't want to discuss the Kurdish-Turkish question now. It's complicated enough and it has not very much to do with the financing of terrorism. We could discuss the role of the Kurdish government in Erbil too. It played its role in, in, in the gas smuggling. Uh, some 20 years ago, after the first US invasion in Iraq, I paid a visit to Erbil and I saw all those oil-loaded load, trucks uh, smuggling, uh, smuggling gas over, over the Turkish border. Everybody saw it, everybody knew it, as today. With the funds being generated to deals like this, and I don't talk about other sources of income, like kidnapping, 
like international criminal activities and uh, like selling uh, like 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 selling uh, everything they can grab at, at archaeological and historical sites and museums and so on and so on what are they doing with those those funds first of all they are paying their fighters and their employees and their offices secondly they have to try to maintain a minimum of infrastructure. And third, they try to buy arms. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't think that the majority of the arms flow going to uh, the, the war region in Syria and, and Iraq comes from sales uh, performed by Daesh forces. It goes a, usually a quite different way. And there are three major inflows of arms into the region. The first is, goes through Bulgaria and Turkey, and those are the old depots of the Eastern Bloc. The old Kalashnikovs, the Russian produced one, the newer Bulgarian produced ones, and so on. These, these deals and these arms flows are organized uh, by people like the former heads of Blackwater, a Socialist of Fortune company which uh, deployed personnel uh, to the Iraqi war, private socialists. Eric Prince, the former owner of Blackwater, is one of the organizers of those arms deals. Uh, secondly, lots of arms are coming from Saudi Arabia and from, from Abu Dhabi. Saudi Arabia is very simple. Saudi Arabia has been a recipient of, of, of lots of major and minor arms, even from Austria. Almost every day I find, I find pictures in newspapers showing Austrian assault rifles, uh, Austrian mortars and so on. Even much more of, of the, these guns and those mortars come from Germany and from other countries. They have been originally sold altogether to Saudi Arabia and they are trickling into the war zone. Abu Dhabi is, is a very different case. If you remember some uh, 20 years ago, uh, to the, uh, the uh, beginning and, and, and the hottest phase of the civil war in Lebanon, Beirut, was something like the arms bazaar of the Middle East. Uh, this role is now being performed by Abu Dhabi. And Abu Dhabi is the selling point and the transfer point for arms going into the war in Yemen, also even Austrian arms. We have made a very, uh, very uh, well-based documentation about that in Austrian Parliament and made a, a case for the public prosecutor out of it. But uh, the majority of the arms is transferred from, from, uh, from Abu Dhabi to, to more and more to African war zones. If you look into Somalia, you find the traces of those arms deeds. And if you look into some other regions too. So, uh, if you know all that, and, and, and something more. You have to try to draw some conclusions. Uh, you can't see the Islamic State, the attempt to create an Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, isolated. You always have to look over the borders. The case of Turkey is completely different from the case of Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Qatar today is something like the rich twin of Daesh. It's basically not different. It's richer, but it's the same. Saudi Arabia pays more attention because its role in the future is not quite clear. But they are made out of the same wood. Kuwait is a bit different because Kuwait is politically uh, quite split up and there are lots of political factions and, and, and whoever governs Kuwait has to take into consideration 
uh, not to confront any of those factions. So MPs supporting Daesh in, Ku in the Kuwaitan parliament or in the governing clan don't have any problems to do that. Uh, the case of Abu Dhabi is just a case of a, of a, of a marketplace. The Turkish case is completely different. I, I gave you some in information about that. But the most important thing is to isolate IS, Daesh, in Iraq and Syria. And if you want to do that, the first step has to be isolate Qatar completely, completely, economically, politically, culturally. It has to be a no entry, no exit state. That's the first step. If you don't go that first step, you don't have any chance to solve the problem. We have to teach them a lesson by all means, except military means that are available at the moment, at least for us in Europe. And as long as Europe is not able to come to terms with the common policy confronting states like Qatar, we can support people fighting uh, for our va values and our ideas in the region. So, that's, that are some of the, in my opinion, most important facts regarding the economic and financial situation of Daesh. But there's another concept and another question that has to be looked into to understand the problem. And that's the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. The rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Turkey will not have direct consequences for uh, the battlefields in Iraq and in Syria. But the fight for predominance in the sunny world has lots of consequences for Europe. The Turkish government has recently changed its strategy completely. The government in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, sticks to its old strategy. Both strategies have very much to do with education and with numbers. They invest heavily in schools, in universities, in teachers, and in prayers. Uh, our services found lots of intelligence within the last month about actions of the Turkish Secret Service MIT in Austria and in Germany concerning schools, concerning predominance in the Turkish population, uh, organizing uh, for the Turkish state within our territory. We are going to face a major problem since the Turkish government has decided not longer trying to become something like uh, some part of the conservative international, the Christ Democrat. It, it, it sounds funny that they tried to be uh, part of this international, but they definitely did. Uh, they stopped that. And they rely only, and that's the core of their strategy, recruiting the people that emigrate from Turkey to countries like Austria and Germany. And make them something like the political troops in our countries. And that's a problem. That's a problem we have to discuss very frankly. And that's a problem where we have to make it very clear to the Turkish authorities that there are some red lines drawn by our parliament that they are not allowed to cross. And they have crossed it many times within the last year. And we are going to stop that. And the Turkish government knows that we are just going to do that now. The same discussion is going to be led uh, in, in, in Germany. I expect the same results in Germany as in Austria. The Saudi Arabian case is a very different case because in, in Austria and in, in Germany we don't have so many 
people of Arab origin living in our countries. That's very different. But what they are doing is building up their completely segregated education system and try to be a strong number two in controlling the Austrian Muslims. And that's uh, something we have to learn very much for the near future. How do we deal with mosques? How do we deal with religious education? Who educates the religious teachers? What role do they play? Who controls them? Who finances them? Is it allowed that Turkish authorities or Bosnian villages pay for the preachers sent them to Austria and control them through, in the case of Turkey, their secret services? Uh, those are only a few facts I wanted to tell you and discuss with you so that you see what the problems we are facing at the moment in the Austrian Parliament, in the Austrian government, uh, and in Austrian security politics are. I'm quite sure those, those problems are solved. But the most important thing is to contribute uh, to, to resolving the crisis in the Middle East. And I say it once again we have to start with Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. We have to learn to deal with the Turkish government in a different way, and that can be the first steps towards, I wouldn't say a solution, but some progress. That's what we have to do as a European Union, and I hope France is going to at least start the same discussions as we in Austria and Germany do at the moment. Thank you very much.